Hello and welcome back to In My Image. This is the first conversion update video for Victoria 2. And what I've been doing so far is to lay the groundwork. I have been poking around, moving borders, adding cores, removing cores, making things more smooth and correct. And I've also ensured that most major nations can be broken up into several smaller countries. This is the current situation with Bayadia. Um, there is something odd with, with Victoria 2, where it in the lobby thinks that Doa bin Salbar is a great power, which it isn't. Um, it says it's number 6, but when you go in game it's actually secondary power number 16. So I made a little decision that makes them become our satellites when we start the game. I've been converting with relative populations. As you can see, there's no massive population in China, just because it is China. No, it is actually divided depending on development in the world. So some nations have a lot of population, some, uh, some have very little. I think the one that has the most is Inalchi with 33.84 million. Yep, Inalchi is super powerful. I have not been um, converting any flags yet, as you might see in the top right corner when I click on stuff. Some of them I've done, like Mengu Timuria and Bayadia, of course. Um, but that's a work in progress, really. So, I've been moving around borders. Um, you can see that the borders are different from the end of EU4, by far. Um, not that big a difference in Europe and Asia. And Africa, well, kind of in Africa, I moved a lot of stuff around here to avoid border gore. But where the most difference, um, where there's the most difference from EU4 is in America. So North America, as you can see, first and foremost, I've renamed all the nations to give them more Mongolian names. I also shuffled around some uh, cores. For example, the very disjointed Comanche is now eaten up by Cherokee, Fox and Choctaw. And um, that's to give them a better starting position, really. You can see that Texas is now Texas. Uh, you can still clearly see what the names are intended to be, but now they have that Mongolian flair. Oregon, for example, is Oregon, which sounds the same but looks different. New Roma, I just renamed it because it didn't have a name that fit. So it's now Ishi Joid. Here in South America, I have merged a lot of smaller states with the same culture into one big one. Brazil is now Nariña, and Nariña is very weak at the start of the game, but they get so much immigration from the rest of the world that they even become great powers sometimes. Um, the other ones just have their borders cleaned up, and as you can see, New Oberlausitz is now Shijolov, and we have some other ones like... New Tata being renamed to Cthulia, Uruguay being Uruguay, and uh, some other examples. Baburia, quite strong, an old world nation that migrated to South America. So, what I would love is tips for what type of events I could make and what type of events you would like to see. What I'm looking for aren't small events, but rather big things. Stuff like, do you think that Nariña should have events that give them claims on South America? In general, this world is going to be way more aggressive than the normal game of Victoria 2. I've cranked up the AI aggressiveness quite high to symbolize the fact that most rulers are still in the mindset of um, constant warfare, which helps a lot in uh, spawning the future... Um, political parties like fascists and communists that I obviously need to rename to something else. I would also like suggestions for what the different political factions should be named and what ideologies they should stand for. I do want to keep the infrastructure in place that regular Victoria 2 uses, at least to a certain degree, because I don't have all the time in the world to mod and I want to focus on stuff that really make an impact for the campaign. So I would like to stay with communism and fascism as the two big endgame things, but what they stand for can be entirely different. For example, I've had this idea that fascism 
should actually be a new form of Bayadian monarchy resurgence, i.e. people seeking to inst install Bayadian absolute monarchs in their nations. Uh, while the communists could be the very opposite of that. They could be staunch anti-Bayadists, trying to oust all Bayads from places of power, including uh, regular offices. Because by, there, there's plenty of Bayads in the world, they just don't always rule. Um, Power-wise, Bayadia is very powerful with these three uh, marches. I've been thinking about events to slightly lower our own power. Um, but I would like suggestions there as well. Right now I have some placeholder event chains just to see how the Observer games go, balance-wise. Where um, Saisfera is inherited by Doabin Salvar, which usually pushes Doabin Salvar over the edge to becoming a great power. Thus, them, they will break free from Bayadia. Um, I also added some events for Kalpi. Currently there is two outcomes, but I'm not entirely satisfied with it where Doa bin Salvar attempts to assassinate the current Bayad ruler in Kalpi, and thus inheriting it, and them either being discovered and thus only seizing a tiny portion of the land, and the rest going to Bayadia, or uh, them succeeding and them getting all of it. Of course I would like to uh, have plenty of wars and stuff to absorb my vassals, and um, Kalpi, in all cases, are going to be... Um, removed and either integrated into Bayadia through decision or Doabin Salbar through event. So suggestions here please. And um, for the rest of the world I'll take any sort of suggestion. Stuff like Japan, should they get claims of the rest on the rest of Tsusni to be able to completely eat them? Should Mengu Tamuria be able to um, I don't know, inst install puppets in Korchia in, in case they happen to find themselves in a great war? Uh, should uh, Constantinia be eaten by Korchia? Korchia has a lot of nations that can be released from it as well. Uh, Bayadia is the only nation where there aren't many nations to release. And that's based on EU4. Because we had no cores um, that could be released. Um, so I think that Bayadia is the only major nation where no nations can be forcibly released. This that you see here, is Bayadia proper. They don't think of themselves as anything else than Bayads. Though stuff like Mengu Temuria, for example, I can load in as Mengu Temuria and show you which nations can be released. It's mostly reshuffled old cores that already existed. And in certain cases, I've added new nations. Uh, I think for Mengu Temuria, they don't have any new ones, but Korchia, that is this one, definitely has. So uh, if I would go and release nations, you can see that I can release Arkai, Bogorchu, Shigividin, Ejil Kant, Shigan, Targithaya, and Tula Ikea. Effectively cutting Mengutumuria down to their heartland, which is this part of it. This is the heartland. Um, I'm sure where their capital is actually, but I believe it's somewhere around here. It's excruciatingly hard to see the capitals in... Victoria, because they're just red dots, and when there's a red dot on a dark red background, that's fairly hard to see. Um, so if I would release all of them, it would look something like this. Let's release them. Yeah, this is the heartland. So, in an eventual war between Bayadia and Mengu Temuria, this is what we could cut them down to. You have Shigan and you have Ijil Kampt. This part is... Um, it currently has no cores. No, uh, sorry, it is um, uh, Targithaya. Um, there's also some cores here that, they can, that can be returned to Karkotan. Let me show you uh, Korchia as well. Oh, and for North America, I have finished some decisions and event chains uh, that I will um, go into uh, some detail on in just a moment. So, um, I can release nations here, and th this used to be 
a very ugly nation when you force them to release all their nations. They would have like splotches of land everywhere. So I just cleaned up their um, borders slightly. And the new one is Yushia, a nation I made just for this, for the sake of releasing. Um, all the provinces here have cores of um, another nation on them, Badigaria, right now. So Badigaria can technically have these returned to it. This is Shiragulia's course down here in northern Italy. So you can see you can release quite some nice nations. The same goes for Inalci and all the other major nations like Targana. Um, so for America, you see that there's three major native nations here. One is uh, an absolute monarchy with a national party. Uh, this is the same. And Shokto is a conservative absolute monarchy. They will be able to... I'm actually gonna switch to one of them. If they gain enough influence, if one of them becomes a great power, which neither of them starts as, they will be able to form the first Hedelgenian states. Hedelgenia being the name of North America in this universe. Um, so unify the Hedelgenian first states. The criteria is that they need to be a great power and the year needs to be... Well, actually, they need to be a great power or the year needs to be after 1860. I thought to add a little fail safe in case they don't form. That's, a, that's an entirely um, adjustable thing though. So I might move it even later. And Victoria 2 is obviously going to be the, the setting for why we have this apocalyptic war in Hoi 4 later on. Uh, so I want as many large, powerful nations as possible by the end of Victoria. That's why I really want to have nations receive events where they can go to war and claim another nation entirely and things like that. So Fox, as an example, has a decision called Protect the Algonquin Peoples, which gives them cores on all of the um, Algonquian majority um, provinces which is most of them, to be honest, in Ishishoid, and also start a war against them to seize that land. Um, I'm not sure which nations you would like to see succeed the most, but feel free to suggest stuff for those. For example, I like both Oregon, Texas, Shokto, Cherokee, Fox, so I, I prefer, preferably I'll make stuff for all of them, but then again, it might not be worth it. I want it to be random though. So for example in South America it would be interesting if it was Nariña versus Baburia. Um, Nariña has a democracy with the Liberal Party and I've been tweaking the migration a bit. So migrations are now way heavier. There's more people migrating and they prefer to migrate to, um, to nations that fit them. So uh, some of them will go to Baburia in case they like absolute monarchies with conservative conservative parties. Some will go to Narinia. Most will go to Narinia. Because they are a liberal democracy, which is pretty much the only one of its kind. The ones in Europe having been destroyed since long ago. So that might be interesting, having a Baburia versus Narinia in um, South America. In Africa, how the Ghost New World starts as a primitive nation. But if they reach civilization status, they usually jump right back up to being a great power. This is entirely because of the uh, decisions they did in EU4. They were so behind in technology. I can show you the civilization levels. As you can see, most are civilized, but there's a few, like Great Britain, that aren't. In America, all except Baburia and the Inca remnants and some minor nations are civilized. And in Asia, all are civilized. All alliances are naturally going to break. So Guglug, for example, and uh, Targana might not be our allies for long. Uh, especially seeing as we might have a vested interest in enacting vengeance upon Targana. Perhaps we should have some events that allow us to claim parts of Targana for the Bayad family again, because it used to be Bayad, maybe it should be again, what do you think? The same here with Guglug, um, Guglug and Japan in the east, should they cooperate or should they fight? It's all open for suggestion. 
In uh, Europe, we have plenty of stuff going on already. Corunia has a lot of cores, for example, on Usunia. The Valatin Horde either grows or shrinks. As you can see, they have plenty of cores almost everywhere. But Garia usually gets eaten up. But if they don't, they might return in the form of rebels. Anyway, um, I can show you some um, in some fun stats because population and such things, um, I won't poke around too much with those. Because the converter did a great job in converting over the population. So if we take a look at Bayadia's pops, for example, we have 22.68 million. And you can see that we have all kinds of people, Gan Mongols, Polynesian, but mostly Inan Mongol. And this is my placeholder icon for Tengulig Odd. This is the Nestorian one, I believe. We have some Vikings, we have some Polynesians in the islands that we took. If you remember, we actually own these. Uh, a naval base for future purposes. Oh yeah, and Australia should definitely have some events where Khan's Land and Togothoid's Landing get claims on each other. Togothoid's Landing is what remains of Megudaria, by the way. I decided to not have Megudaria here because Megudaria uh, was pretty much ousted from their old lands. So I let their old colony take over. But maybe they should have an option of forming Megudaria if they manage to take stuff back. Anyway, the population is very interesting. You can see that we have 77.5% farmers. Our literacy is at 80%, which is the highest in the world, I believe. Mostly Tengri God, some Norse. We have artisans, soldiers, aristocrats. I don't think we don't have any capitalists, which is a bit of a shame. We also don't have any slaves. And our people is mostly happy for now. We're over our ship limit. So we might have to do something about that, building naval bases. And uh, yeah, this is looking really good for us. But the other nations are also in a very strong position of power. In the overnights or, or um, observer games that I do, I um, usually see Inalchi racing to the top. As it starts, you can see that... Um, Let's see, where do we actually see this? It's Diplomacy, Great Powers. Yeah, we can sort here. Megatomuria, Japan, Korchia, Targana, Inalchi, Guglug. They all have a very good chance of making it to the top. I think of all the, all the mega campaigns I have done, this is the most varied one in the Observer games. Either one of these can make it out on top, either one can be crushed and sent to the bottom. I have seen the Alkmarids take the first spot, something that irks me, because they are tribal. They've been tribal since CK2, and they didn't reform out of tribalism in EU4 either. Ah, irritates me so much. Anyway, this is the first update, and um, feel free to suggest anything. Um, border changes, events, what would you like to see, etc. And I will continue modding for a few more weeks before starting the actual Let's Play. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again in the next update video.